Okay, um, I guess hello to everybody. Um, I know it's morning and afternoon and evening because I see people are really from all over. We are so blessed and honored to have all of you here and, um, and it's great excitement for us to celebrate women photographers all over the world. I don't know if everyone is aware that August is Women's Month in South Africa and on the 9th we've actually got a holiday for women. So um, we are really happy and excited to celebrate that with all of you sharing this passion of ours. And um, I want to introduce you to a very special lady. Her name is Sarah. And um, she founded this group, Women in Wildlife Photography. And there's so much that I can tell you about that, but I think she's going to do that. And the only thing I would like to say about that is that I really want you to go and have a look at the group. I've never seen so many women supporting each other in such a wonderful way. So Sarah, thank you for joining us. Thank you for that incredible group. Thank you for all the inspiration we get from there. And tell us your story. Sure. Well, I, I am a wildlife photographer. Um, I've been doing it seriously now for about eight years. Um, I'm based on Cape Cod in Massachusetts. So I'm surrounded by beautiful coastline. So I actually do a lot of shorebird photography. Um, and I, I especially love doing uh, ground level photography. I do a lot of um, ground level photography because I really, really enjoy that shallow depth of field um, and creating those soft muted backgrounds. Um, so um, that's really my passion. And I spend a lot of time uh, at the beach doing uh, uh, little chicks. Uh, we have a lot of um, nesting shorebirds here on the Cape. Yeah, so for example, this is um, a piping plover chick. Um, and again, I'm, I'm, my chin is in the sand in, in this photo because I, I love um, making those really soft backgrounds. Um, and then the next one um, you'll see, I believe, is a swallow photo that um, was in flight and um, picking up um, pine needles off of the ground. Um, and that photo actually, um, I was very pleased, made it into the Audubon Top 100 this year. Um, and then the last photo is of a common loon. Um, and I put this one in black and white because I really loved how it showed the, the details of the wings. Um, so that just, that just gives you an idea of the type of photography that I like to do. I started the group um, Women in Wildlife Photography. I started it on Facebook uh, about three years ago. And I started it because uh, as you all know, um, those on this panel, and I'm sure most of you that are watching, um, the, the ratio of women to men in wildlife photography is very, very lopsided. So I wanted to have a space where um, women could go and share their photography and feel supported and encouraged. Um, and, and that's really what it has become. It's just a very, very friendly space um, and another reason is that I, I also wanted to encourage more people in general, but, but women especially, to, to get out in nature because nature is so, so healing. And, you know, women, um, I think, you know, we juggle a lot. We juggle family, we juggle careers. Um, on a personal level, I have struggled with um, depression for most of my life. And I've certainly had my share of uh, trauma in my life. And I have to say that the one thing, the, the, the best elixir for me has been nature and immersing myself in nature and getting out there and just um, seeing, surrounding yourself with all of these tiny little miracles that, that make up our world is just so exhilarating. Um, it's uplifting, it's life affirming. 
Um, and photography in particular forces you to, to see all of these little miracles that are often overlooked, um, you know, that you wouldn't often see. And if you're not getting out there and peering through a lens and with wildlife photography, for me, it's making eye contact um, with another creature is, um, it's, it's really just a miracle. And it's just, I feel a connection. And uh, again, that's very healing for me. And I, I just want other people to know that. Um, I really would love for other women to know that, that, uh, you know, if you get out there in nature, um, I think that you'll find a lot of healing there. So um, that's really why I started the group. And I hope that more women come to the group. We have about 13,000 members uh, right now. We also have a hub on uh, Instagram, um, which is really just getting up and going, but um, that's growing very fast. Um, and what I, what I love about the, the group, and Veronica, you kind of touched on this, is that it really is just such a wonderful group of, of lovely women that um, you know, are just there to support and encourage each other. You know, it's not about who's posting the best photo. It's just about, um, you know, here's my work, I'm putting it out there. And, you know, you'll get a lot of, a lot of support and encouragement. So, yeah, that's really all I have to say about the, about the group. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And um, I think Monique is going to show us the first um, few yeah. slides. Mm -hmm. from, from this, the, the ladies of the group yeah and then we would like you to tell us a bit about the first one and we'll scroll through them and i really want to thank all of the the ladies who presented us with their fantastic work well it was a great turnout i think we had um about 45 to 50 submissions this photo right here um intrigued me a great deal this is um by Amy Riddle, and she is based in Houston, Texas. She's been doing photography for about three years, so not very long, um, and that's just a, a fabulous photo. Um, but what I like about this is that I think it's a great example of using photography to tell a story. Um, you know, when, you're look, when you look at this photo, I know I go, well, you know, why is the elephant lifting its leg like that with the baby underneath? What's going on here? What's going on in this photo? Um, and Amy says what was happening was uh, the little baby was so eager to get to the watering hole and mom was trying to hold it back. And um, she eventually just gave in and lifted her leg and, and let the little baby go through and, and, and go to the watering hole. So. I, I just think it's a, it's a great example of, um, of, of storytelling and, and showing something a little different. Um, I've never photographed elephants. I hope to change that someday, but um, I haven't quite seen a, an elephant photo like this. I think, it's, I think it's special. It's really unique and beautiful. Let's look at the others.
So now it is really my great pleasure to introduce Julie to all of you. Julie has been a wonderful friend for many years. We've shared so much together. We are really sisters in photography. And um, I think you're going to really enjoy what she's got to say. And um, what I want to mention is she wrote this incredible book. And um, she, she's going to tell you about that. And you will love it. Thanks, Julie. Thank you, Veronica and Monique and Nico and Sarah and Ilana, everyone who's here. I'm very moved at us acknowledging women in wildlife photography. And I feel like we bring something else to the table. There's that deep, anyway, I experience a very deep mystical connection to the animals and the habitats and all the goings on. And I believe that the lens looks both ways. So with that being said, I love that there's being some femininity brought into a lot of the wildlife photography and images that are out there. So for me, I got started, uh, I was a scuba diver escaping a chaotic corporate career, and I had an encounter with wild bottlenose dolphins that to this day I've still yet to see footage of what I saw of a mating ritual where the female who was chosen to mate with would drop down in the water column, the other two females would come and cradle her. And they would just fall as he would come by and mate. And it was in that moment I said, I'll never be in the water again without a camera. And that set the course of my photography life. And that was um, in, let's see, that was 1999. So I've been with a camera mostly underwater. It started a long, long time ago when I was five years old. I was watching Mutual Omaha's Wild Kingdom and this thing came over me of, I need to go to Africa before I die. And so it became this, this vein of gold, this line of energy that I started following. And I started underwater like I shared and then started moving to Africa and doing thing on land and realizing that I had this great connection with apex predators. And so I photograph anything and everything and a lot of my great love is the big cats and the bears and I have encounters with them that have been really incredible. And so I'm going to take you through just a, some of my, a few of my images. So as I said, it started for me underwater. I became a free diver in Hawaii where I dropped all the tanks and the bubbles because the marine mammals use bubbles as a warning signal. So a human in the water blowing bubbles isn't really effective when you want to photograph animals. And what I started to find is that by connecting to nature with this way, in this way, eye to eye, that the lens became a portal to this other world. These are um, pantropic spotted dolphins. And that I was having this transmission with the animals it's, and I was different every time I was having this encounter, I felt pulled into their world. And it's, it's what I call that it started to become my medicine and for many, many things and the bears being in the glacial creek and sparring with each other and like them showing me their world where this was a particular place in Katmai, Alaska where there's no, there's no humans. You have to camp and get your own water and everything. And I hope to take Veronica's husband there next year. It's quite extraordinary because you're surrounded by 30, 40 bears all the time. And you get immersed in their world. And as Sarah was sharing how healing you know, nature is for us. And then there's these moments where I was in a hide and this is the last time this rhino, female rhino ever had her horn intact because a poacher had entered the property. And so there's these things going on in our world that impact wildlife so deeply. And by sharing space with them and feeling into that medicine that they can, they really exude to us their pure presence and their essence. And I feel like there's so much that we're getting from that that we can't even give words to. And then also being in the face of the impact of our encroachment on habitats, of culture's desires for animal body har parts, harvesting for thing them for things that there are medications for. I also want to be a voice and an activist for standing up for expanding the wildlands and protecting these animals before they're not on our planet anymore so that you know seven ten generations from now get to enjoy them live as well 
And the animals give you these stories, these incredible moments of encounters that you could never make up in your own life. A lioness with cubs and they're playing with her like they'd play with each other and their playing is a little bit of boot camp too. You know, then they go walking and they lower their head, you know, below their shoulders and they go into hunting mode and you watch a baby do that. And it's fascinating what's happening there. And I think that the time has come when we have to really stand up for animals and start to do something. And this is a particular moment where we had a mom with eight cheetah cubs and got to walk with her. It was an extraordinary time. It will probably never happen again. And these two males, you know, jumped up and started sparring with each other. And you just never know the delight that the animals are going to give you. And I think being women behind the lens, we bring a different point of view. We bring a different angle. We bring something to it that the, that the, the men have been doing it and it's great. And there's a lot of incredible photography out there. And it's time that women got more recognized and were noticed that we can take world-class images and that we're bringing something to it. For me, these are mystical encounters. And you know what I call the medicine is, has become my ministry and it's transformed into something bigger. And you know the female fox, like the work that the feminine does in the wild of taking care of the kits. And then she goes roaming out and before you know it, she's pouncing on her prey. I am particularly like action wildlife of the apex predators that's what i get really excited about and you know this is where i've spent a lot of my passion and so i'll just close with this slide one of my favorite bear cub moments really there's so much emotion in this photo these two are siblings i don't know if they were males or females and they were having so much fun with each other and clearly had just been weaned from mom they're probably about three years old but they kept doing all this goofy stuff and I love their full expression of who they are and the entertainment value. And I feel like every time I'm in the wild with my lens and my camera, I'm, I've evolved somehow. And I encourage everyone to really take stock of the opportunities that are available when they're out there and share that world with everyone else as well, who wouldn't go sit in a meadow with 30 bears, but really enjoy seeing the images. So thank you. Thank you, Julie. That was absolutely magnificent, taking us on that journey. Will you please just say something about your book for us before we um, oh have, sure go on? Yeah, I never want to be like salesy. <laughs> so I have a <laughs> no, book called Wild Sacred, Sacred Beauty, and Lo Veronica's husband is my photography mentor. I met him about six years ago, and this is a project of love that he and I worked. He worked as hard on it as I did, and Veronica and some other people in putting this together. And it's really a journey through um, around the world, Antarctica, Africa, the North Pole of the photography and the messages that the animals have given me and also a voice for the philanthropic ways we can get involved in the organizations. It's really a conservation take on a woman in the wild having really incredible encounters. And it's available on my website if you wanna get a copy. The money all goes to land trust funds so that's a project that I've worked on and it was published right in March of 2020. So we know how that went. <laughs> right. it, Thank you, Julie. Um, Thank Monique you. is going to show us the next few um, photographs of the next um, ladies. Oh, yes, I, I love this one. This is, um, this is by Landy. Fury, I hope I'm saying that correctly. And she's from South Africa. She's been doing photography since 2008. Um, and this was taken in Kruger National Park. And I just, I, it's so intense. And I, it, she said something in the group um, when she posted this that I, that I, I think touched a lot of us. Um, and that is that, you know, as women, we're often expected to take these cute photos, you know, of, um, you know, like, like me, little chicks and things. <laughs> but, um, you know, this is really raw and really intense. And this is a baboon um, that was feasting on an impala. And um, as she tells it, 
apparently the alpha male came in. And um, at that point she stood up holding her baby. I mean, I, at first I didn't even notice the baby there, holding her baby and, you know, while, while holding the, the prey in, in her teeth. And I just think that that is just so, it's so impactful. It really is. And, and again, I think she's right. It's, it may not be a photo that you would necessarily expect from a woman, but, you know, these are the types of photos that, um, that we can take and, and we do take them. But a uh, really great photo, thank you.
Yeah, so let me introduce myself. My name is Veronica. Um, I am a wildlife photographer and a portrait photographer. And I have been doing photography since I was 14 years old. It's always been just my entire life. And um, I think a very important thing is that we sometimes just take a step back and ask why. Why do we do what we do? And um, I do wildlife photography um, for a very specific reason. I want to connect with nature, like most of you, but um, I also want to tell my life story. And I love doing that with my, with my photography. And I also use my wildlife photography in my art. And I will show you a bit about that um, as we go along. But the most important thing I really want to share with all of you tonight and this afternoon and this morning for some of you is a place that is so close to my heart. It is the Chobe River in Botswana. And I think some of you have been there, but I see Julie say hey, thumbs up there. It is absolutely a magnificent place. And I actually relate so much to that river that I have created a whole body of art that is called I Am the River. And I'm sure that most of you will relate to what I say about a river. Um, what I think of if I think about a river and how it relates to us is that it is actually a metaphor for our lives. Um, we have three levels or three aspects about a river and it's what you see there in front of you it's the surface of the water it's the surroundings it is the river banks it is this incredible view in front of us and then it's also the trees Monique's going to page through them for us here you can see it's flood season so the trees are very deep in the water these are jackalberries there um, on the river and um, there's also the water lilies the reeds everything that's the surface that's what we see it's incredible and then we have the the animals there on the river and um, we have most incredible bird species there the Chobe river actually have 460 different bird species and um, it's absolutely incredible to, to see that. You can see the little fish jumping there. And there's just, uh, you know, more than 90 different fish species in the in the Chobe River. And um, Monique will page on for us to the next one. Another thing about this surface of the river and the surroundings are these incredible sunsets that we get there. Um, so that is the first layer. And I think you can see where this go, um, if I say it's a metaphor for our lives. So the second thing is what the river reflects. So sometimes the river reflects that you can see this is absolutely, it's a mirror and, um, and it reflects absolutely everything back to us. And then sometimes you get these surreal images and it's almost like a impressionistic painting. And then there's always those dark, angry clouds, black, fiery feelings that this river is reflecting back to us. So that is the second layer that I that I think a river actually does sort of that is similar to us, what we reflect. And then the third layer of a river for me is what lies beneath. And I think there's some, maybe the people don't really think about that often, but there's these strong undercurrents and there are these tides and sometimes it's treacherous and dangerous. This You can see this buffalo battling to go through that current. And I've got an elephant there that's swimming through the river, taking babies through. It's difficult, it's dangerous. 
um, that's also one of the things that we don't see. But then we have these beautiful shallow pools. You can see the sunlight there on the water, white sandy beaches. That's also underneath, but it's different. And then we have these scary underwater creatures that can jump out from nowhere. And I've really waited quite a while to get a photograph like this. And, um, and it was unbelievable. So there are these crocodiles and the hippos. The hippos walk and run underwater. You don't even know they're there. And um, so now you can see that's for me the third layer of what lies underneath that we don't always think about. So if I want to sort of say what that means for me and other photographers, lady photographers, I'm sure you're going to relate to this. So if we look at the first aspect, this beautiful surface, I think that is what we sometimes get from other photographers or other people who don't do photography, that if a lady or a woman do wildlife photography, I think that is so glamorous. It's just incredible. It's this glamorous thing you do. And they don't realize what goes into that that is not really as glamorous as it might think. Um, I know that when you set this intention, I'm going on this safari, or I'm going on this expedition, or sometimes just some, some things as simple as I'm picking up my camera and I'm walking to the beach to go and photograph, or I'm picking up my camera and I'm going to the closest park to my house to go and take photographs. Sometimes that wide spectrum take so much from us because we are not all fit and healthy and as energetic as we want to be so sometimes that really takes a lot from us to do that and schlepping luggage in airports and heavy equipment is really not that glamorous but they look at our photographs and it seems so effortless and, uh, <laughs> and all of us know that's not really how it is. So you, you can see what I want to try and say there. And then the next level in our lives as what we reflect through our work, through our photographs. Um, and I think that is something that maybe people don't also think of. Julie said, the lens looks both ways. And for me, that is the reflection of the river. It's also the reflection of us with our photographs, what we show the world. We share our feelings, we share our emotions, we share our joy, we, sh we share our suffering, and we reflect that from in our photographs. And then the next thing I want to share with you is what people don't see, what lies beneath in our lives as the river, is that I know a lot of women photographers only started photography after they retired. And some of them are in their 70s and even in their 80s, but they still travel and they still do their photography. And because it is, it became such a passion. And, and that doesn't always... Um, go without challenges and then I mean I know a lot of us women photographers who go through chemotherapy who has been diagnosed with all kinds of illnesses who have back operations and neck operations and lots of other um, things to deal with health-wise and um, with just um, so many things in our lives and I I know that um, this is something that we use to overcome that but people don't always realize that so whether you are young and fit and healthy or any of these other spectrum of what I want to call disabilities um, and I say that very respectful um, 
we can overcome that in different in different ways. I want to tell you a little bit about myself. I've really had health problems since I was very young. And um, there, there was a stage that I was in a wheelchair. I couldn't care for myself. I had a caretaker. And it took a lot of courage, encouragement, um, help from a lot of people, determination. And it was possible for me to overcome that. And after seven years of not thinking I will ever do photography again, I was able to do that again. So um, I think in a way, my health situation um, shaped the way that we do safaris um, because we custom built vehicles and boats to make it easy for people from young and strong to someone in a wheelchair to be able to sit next to each other, level the playing field, and everyone can take the same photograph with more or less the same ease. Do you agree, Julie? I think Julie is muted. So I think what you're touching on here is so important as women empowering us. Yeah, the equipment can be heavy. There's been strides made in reducing it, but when you carry multiple bodies and lenses and what other accoutrement and batteries and, you know, tripod yeah. heads and things like that with you, being able to come somewhere and first of all, knowing that you and Monique are at the other end is everything. But then going to on these vehicles where the windows open and I'm in what I would call, I think you guys have called it business class in the bush before, <laughs> in a captain's chair that'll turn 360 degrees and I have two Wimberleys and I just plop my cameras up there. And if I don't have the big lenses, I can also borrow them right from you and or, excuse me, rent them. And I'm set and I don't. I have a, ne a neck injury and it is not compatible with photography, wildlife photography. And I'm out on our bay for hours holding my camera up, waiting for whales to lunge feed. And I get off and I'm like this. And so to know that there's women who will receive me, but also there's these vehicles set up to remove the physical stress. Yeah, absolutely. Right propels my images it even because the lens looks both ways so if i'm feeling that physical stress and pain my images aren't the same as when i feel supported absolutely so we like to talk about traveling with ability so i've seen that in sarah's group this womanhood this sisterhood supporting each other um so I really want all the women to think about, I'm a single lady. I always travel alone. Why not make friends with people who also want to go to Africa, who also want to go photograph the bears? Let's get together. Let's do this. And let's support each other. Doesn't matter where in the spectrum you fall from young and strong to as challenged as possible. And then the one thing I want to still share with you is, how I use my photographs in my art. So Monique can turn to that page that I just quickly show you some of it. You will see I've used that iconic image of my jackalberries. Um, and um, this image is called elusive butterfly. And, and that can be for anything, health, love, um, whatever you need in your life sometimes it's just so elusive but um determination just keep keep doing it keep at it and so it's this is an outpouring of my emotions you can do the next one monique this image is a very typical africa scene with a baobab tree um it was a it is um the moon i took it in on the at the Chobe River, it was an eclipse of the moon, and the um, Marshall Eagle 
this one is um, called The Black Moon and just also just telling some of my life story. And the next one, I just want to check the time. I'm talking too much. We still need to give Ilana some time. All right, this one is called ref Reflection um, because I really think I reflect a lot on my life, on my work, on where I am and where I want to be. And you can see this fish eagle, they're very territorial. They actually grab, grab this um, bachelier by both feet and just tossed him out of the air. It was an incredible thing to see. And um, so everything is obviously symbols for specific stories. So I'm trying to tell specific stories with my art. And the next one, Monique, this is a very special image. Um, it is about the Chobe River. This image is called Trapped Rivers or Trapped River. Uh, these two little young um, lions came to drink. We are in the boat close to the shore. They came right up to us and drank water there. It was such a beautiful moment. Um, and the, I want you guys to go and read about the Chobe River. It's, it is it is a complicated system of waterways, but the river is actually trapped between the Lenanti swamps on the one side and the Zambezi River on the other side that cascades over the, the Victoria Falls. But um, it originates in Angola. So it's a very intricate, complicated water system. And there is a spot where the water turn and it flows both ways. It's incredible to see. So I'm totally in love with this river. Okay, Nikki, next one. Now there's somebody that needs to be at Mrs. Akari. This image is called Never. And it's got a lot of different meanings. Um, this fish eagle is bringing in the moon and the moon being the light. Um, and I really thought I will never be able to do wildlife photography ever again. I really felt that I've lost who I am and part of my being. And after seven years being back doing safaris, being back behind the camera, um, I thought that door was closed for me forever, but it wasn't. Um, so this is an image of hope to all of you out there. Thank you for watching my photographs. I want to show you some of the ladies that's been with me. There you can see on the boat having fun, the support system we have there for the cameras. And um, I hope that I've illustrated to you um, how I love teaching women to not to just look, but to really see deeper meanings in situations, in, in behavior, and that um, should you wish, I have two safaris in 2023 and 2024, that is Africa and art, that we will create something like this after the safari, or during the safari, and you will go home with a, with a canvas. So check my website, send me an email. It will be wonderful to, to host any of you. So cheers to all the ladies and thank you for joining us. Okay, for the third time now, I'm going to say um, that this is a great example, I think this photo is, of um, breaking one of the cardinal rules, which is, uh, you know, to get your subject at eye level, you know, you'll hear lots of wildlife photographers tell you that, you know, especially with birds, you know, get them at eye level. And I always say, um, break the rules. You know, I think that breaking the rules is really the only way to really stretch your creativity. And this photo works. This photo works, even though, you know, the bird is not at eye level. Um, the eye is drawn upward from the branch to the bird. And then you see the cloud coming in from the right. And it really, you know, just kind of points to the bird. And I think that this works really, really well, even though um, there are many photographers that would tell you, well, this should really be at eye level, you know? And by the way, this is a, a European green finch, and this is by um, Sane Rosemay, 
and she's based in Denmark and has been doing photography for about three years. So um, yeah, I, I'm big on breaking the rules and um, really trying new things and don't, you know, don't get, um, don't get boxed in by rules too much because I think that you can come up with a lot of creative things by breaking um, the so-called rules of wildlife photography. I would love to introduce Ilana to you. She's a CNP Safari tour leader. She's a magnificent photographer. If anybody wants to know anything about technical stuff of photography, she's your girl. Thank you, right. Ilana. Thank yes. You, thank, you. thank you very much. Hi, everyone. I have no idea what to say after that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, um, I can't even compete with my learned friends, Veronica, Sarah, Julie, thank you so much. I'm very much an Afrikaans chick, so I have to excuse myself right from the bat. Be with me. I hope you will get some tips and tricks from me. So, oh, I have to say, what a wonderful opportunity to be part of this very special webinar. When we celebrate our women wildlife photographers, I hope this will be the first of many, many more to come. All right, so my name is Yelona and I'm a photography leader for CNP Safaris. A question I get asked a lot is what settings do you use? 
So I want to touch a little bit more on the technical side of things. And for this, I need to go back to where it all started. 10 years ago, I went with CNP Safaris to the Chobe River in Botswana. I was a total beginner, a complete novice. This was my very, very first photography trip ever. So I was under the guidance of Lo Kutzer. And during our morning and afternoon sessions on the river, he would talk us through our settings. I want to share an image of an African fish eagle that was taken two days into the trip. So if you just bear with me a little bit, I'm going to see if I can share my screen here. So if you look at this image that was taken two days into my trip, please keep in mind that at this time I had no experience, none whatsoever. I had no knowledge, nothing. So when I looked at this result, I was absolutely blown away. And I knew there and then that this was the way I want to shoot. This was the way I want to do my photography. I absolutely believed in the result and that took me forward on my journey. And 12, well, basically 10 years now going on, I still shoot the same way. So that was the image we started off with. And I have to say that that was the start of it. Um, for me, that was just amazing and I could not believe the result. So it didn't take a lot of convincing for me to know this. It was the way that I wanted to sh shoot. Okay, so what I think I want to do is I want to share my settings with you and why it works for me. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you the settings that I use. Um, I shoot aperture priority and because I want to, because I shoot aperture priority is I want complete control over my depth of our field. So the scene dictates my chosen aperture. So let me just see if I can find the next image for you. So let's look at this image. For example, here I've chosen aperture of a four. Why? Because I want to blur my background. So it's an intentional setting. I go, I dial it in. There it is. I want to blur my background. But now I have a scene where a lot of things are happening at the same time. I have juvenile fish eagles coming in. I have an adult fish eagle going out. I've got an egret in the scene. It's coming out. It's going back. I need to think about my depth of field. Remember, we are working with long lenses. That's what wildlife photographers do. We work with long lenses. And if we do not keep an eye on our depth of field, we will often find ourselves wanting. So aperture priority allows me to dial in my aperture while the camera sets the shutter speed automatically for the correct exposure. Very important though, I will always keep my eye on the shutter speed. But on the camera itself, I don't fiddle with dials and buttons and all that to change my shutter speed. I leave it to the camera to do the work for me. Right. In action, in wildlife photography, the action happens quickly and unexpectedly. And that's why I always strive to have the highest possible shutter speeds. Let's look at the data. So the rule of thumb says to prevent camera shake, your shutter speed should be more or less three or four times your focal length. So let's for argument say you're shooting on a 600 millimeter lens. That will give you a shutter speed of around 2000 of a second. If you look closely at the image of the daughter, you will see here that the tips of the wings is soft. And the only reason for that is my shutter speed was too low. It wasn't fast enough. Fast action requires fast shutter speeds. In this instance with a daughter, 
my shutter speed was only 2,500 of a second. So think about that. Many photographers think that 2,000, 2,500, even 3,200 is enough, but it's not. So I shoot, and I know this is going to sound crazy, but I shoot at 8,000 seconds, even higher. I didn't do that 10 years ago. I've learned to do that now. It's a process. It's an understanding of what's happening when you're working with fast shutter speeds. So I'm going to show you an image of baby elephants. If I find, there we go, find them. So I'm sitting at Elephant Valley on the Chobe River. I shot these baby elephants at 8,000 of a second. So you might ask, why on earth would I shoot elephants at 8,000 of a second? They are big animals, they are not moving very quickly or rap rapidly, and the answer is simple. Because I prepare myself for whatever action happens around me. So while I'm looking at the elephants, or watching the elephants, I'm very aware of what's going on around me. Birds are flying in and out. There's things happening. You've got to be ready for that, for that action that's taking place around you. So here's the next scene. So while I'm working the elephants, the pied kingfisher dipped right in front of us. So, 8,000 of a second elephants, is it overcompensating? Surely, definitely. But if I was working the elephants at, let's say, 3,200 of a second, 4,000 of a second, and this little pipe dropped into the water in front of me, that would not have been enough to freeze the wings. If you look at the wings here, it's sharp. That is shutter speed. So I've learned from my wildlife photography. Shutter speed is it. You've got to understand the settings working together. Now adjusting settings is not a complicated task. But it's time consuming. So if you set yourself up for success right from the start, the better your chances of nailing the shot and ending up with a great result. You're going to ask me, how do I get my shutter speeds up? Now, there are two ways of doing so. In the old days, we used to work at an ISO of more or less 100. That was the film days. Nowadays, our cameras can handle higher ISOs. So from the start, dial in a higher base ISO because our cameras can handle it. I work at 800, 1000, 1250. In the image of this spur wing goose, here we go, I had low light. I had to crank my eyes out to 3200 to get my shutter speed up. Because remember now, we can denoise in post editing. But if your subject is not sharp because of slow shutter speeds, then you end up with a poor shot. And another tip that I can give you to get your shutter speeds up, and this is very valuable, is minus negative exposure compensation. I know there's this old thing about having your histogram to the right. I have mine left of center. Why? Because it protects my whites, my highlights. There is no software currently on earth that can bring back your highlights. Shooting negative, let's say minus two, you can then go post editing, drag your ex exposure and up. I guarantee you, your sensor will be able to handle that. So that, now to summarize, let's just quickly go back. I'm gonna end off with this little photo. Yeah, so I had aperture priority. I had very high shutter speed. 8,000 of a second. I was shooting negative exposure value of minus 2 and I had an aperture of f8. 
you look at the result and then do tell me if you think that works like a charm. I really would like to take the opportunity to say please come and join us on trips. I think Veronica said it, let's travel together. Um, I think it's wonderful that ladies are getting together, standing together, sharing their photos, are passionate about what they're doing. And I'm telling you, we're showing the men how it's, how it's been done out there. Um, thank you for the time. I hope I was able to, say, to share with you something uh, valuable. Thank you so much. Yes, this is one. Uh, this is by Chantelle Wanton, and she's based in Paris, France, has been doing photography for about two years. And I just like this one because it's a great example of using uh, light and, um, you know, to create impact in a photo. This was taken during sunrise, and uh, there was lots of dust. And so it, it created this beautiful orange glow. And I think that she captured that so well. Um, this is also a, a, a baboon and an impala in this photo, but I, I think it's just beautiful. Thank you, Chantel. And I want to thank everybody for submitting their photographs. Um, thank you for being such a wonderful group that I'm part of. I want to thank Julie. And I want to thank Ilana for your contribution. And thank you so much, Sarah. 
And um, thanks for Monique and Niku who worked very hard behind the scenes. And um, it was such a wonderful experience. I really think you girls can all give yourself a pat on the back and say, cheers to us women photographers, we doing our thing. Thank you and goodbye. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Mm -hmm. Well, good morning. In the <laughs> Thank you. Good good night. Morning. It's lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day.